So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to session four, uh, the multimodal web. Uh, I hope you've been enjoying the presentations as much as I did uh, since this morning. Uh, we had great presentations and we also have uh, five great papers in this session as well. Uh, we will be having uh, two communications and three technical papers. And just wanted to give you a heads up that we also have one paper which is nominated for best technical paper candidate. So it's a candidate for best paper. Uh, so let's get started. The first presentation is the paper titled Where Skilled, Personalized and Interchangeable Input with Variables for Users with Motor Impairments. Uh, it's authored by Ovidio Andre Schuper, Lara Bianca Villis, Radu Daniel Batavu. I apologize for my pronunciation. So Ovidio, would you like to start? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Yeliz, for your uh, introduction. Uh, I uh, will start my presentation. Do you see the slides? Yes, we can, and okay. we can hear you well. Okay. So, hello, my name is Ovidius Skipor. I'm Associate Professor at Stepan Chalmari University of Java. And also, I'm a member of uh, the Machine Intelligence and Information Visualization Lab. And today I'm going to present to you uh, where skill system and the way uh, it can be effectively used for enabling personalized and uh, interchangeable input for users with motor impairment. So um, all, you, are you there? Uh, I'd like to start by saying that uh, the Machine Intelligence and Information Visualization Lab is an interesting and enhanced way people interact. Yes, yes, I'm here. Uh, it seems like sounds dropped, dropped a bit, but... Do you hear me? It's okay. Can you please try again? We do. Are you there? Do you, do you hear me? Uh, now we can hear, hear me? you. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you now. Please continue. Oops, dropped. Uh, I guess he lost connection. We can wait for a minute, probably he will join again. Oh, we do. Uh, yes. Can you hear us? Okay, please yes. try to share again. It seems like you had some connection problems. Yes, uh, it looks like there are some technical problems. Okay, please try again. Do you hear? Do you hear now? And do you? See? Yeah, we can see and hear. Ho hopefully, it will be okay. Okay, so uh, we, we introduced Swear Skill, a web application that implements personalized and interchangeable input for wearable computing. We outline uh, four quality requirements. Swear Skill present the engineer, engineering fails of the implementation using web technology. People with motor impairment show that where skill can provide accurate recommendations for personalized input modalities that match uh, more than 80% with users' own preferences. 
uh, wearable devices have become uh, increasingly available in the context of IoT environments. With a global market of more than 40 billion U, uh, American dollars in 2020 and uh, a two-digit digits uh, yearly growth, wearables are becoming mainstream due to their mainly uh, well with as end user, users who are part of this market. People with motor impairments experience challenges interacting with wearables. In this slide, there are findings of a previous paper written within our research laboratory. In this article, a systematic literature review on wearable interactions for users with motor impairments was conducted. For example, For example, the slide shows, do you hear me? Um, we can. Um, the slide shows uh, the categories of wearables on the left and the input modalities on the right, identified in the systematic literature review. The results show limited research conducted on accessible wearable interactions. For example, just four papers addressing smart uh, watch input and the disproportionate interest for hand gestures compared to other input modalities for wearable devices and the elements involved in user studies. The same paper uh, stated the wise conceptual, conceptual framework as the foundation for future research uh, directions on accessible wearable interactions for users with uh, motor impairments. Based on this framework, we formulate four functional requirements, F1 to F4 for wear skill. First of all, uh, wear skill must be flexible to integrate a variety of wearables and uh, their integration must require only minimal software changes at the outer layer of the software architecture. Secondly, where skill facilitates execution of system functions on various output devices, for example, a PC or a TV set with input performed with wearables. The third uh, characteristic, uh, wearables, uh, where skill offers out of the box support for logging input data to enable more studies to learn about how users employ wearables and how they personalize input. And finally, extension. Uh, the main goal of wear skill is to enable personalized and interchangeable input with wearables at the middleware for a distributed user interface. We choose six quality requirements for uh, uh, wear skill uh, that are taken from uh, the square model. Uh, Q1, which is uh, modularity, then uh, reusability, uh, interoperability, replaceability, appropriateness, and Q6, which is learnability. We also choose, we also implement uh, quality requirements uh, but um, by um, adopting three technological t1 to t3 um, um, approaches and the three design patterns d1 to d3 as you can see we mainly um, rely on web technologies due to their portability we also use dependency injection and uh, um, communication through software interfaces. We will also employ high coverage end-to-end -end testing. In order to uh, implement our functional requirements, we designed six software components for wear skill. Uh, C1 is the profile component. Uh, it enables user to enter personal data. 
Then uh, we have uh, the preferences uh, section, which employs recommendation generated by uh, a machine learning model that uses information from a profile to suggest wearables and input modalities. Then we have a registration of input and output devices. Then we have uh, the input component that is in charge of detecting and recognizing motion, touch, and voice input that user can particularize uh, by providing training samples. Uh, C5 is uh, the command uh, section run on uh, output devices and uh, these commands can be used to control uh, output devices such as a TV or other computer. Uh, C6 uh, uh, users can supervise the entire process from the runtime monitor component. You can uh, see that all these software components addresses both personalization and uh, interchangeability. The preference software component integrates a machine learning model that employs 11 self-reported motor symptoms entered by a user as yes, no responses when setting their web profile. Spasm, load, strength, tremor, poor coordination, rapid fatigue, difficulty gripping, difficulty holding, lack of sensation, difficulty uh, controlling direction, difficulty controlling distance. We conducted uh, a user study to collect the data needed to train this software component. Uh, a number of uh, 21 people with motor impairment, um, for example, spinal cord injury located at various vertebrae, uh, spina bifida, traumatic brain injury, age between 28 and uh, um, 60 uh, years old. We used an online uh, questionnaire to elicit uh, preference ratings for uh, various combinations of wearables and input modalities using five point liquor scales with it items ranging from one not suitable uh, to five very suitable. We collected a total number of uh, 21 participant, participants multiplied by 11 symptoms, which give us uh, 231 records representing predictors for uh, the recommendations within the preference component. We em employ uh, scikit-learn to evaluate various classifiers on our data set. Our choice of algorithms included linear models, classifier, decision trees, semi-supervised models, neural networks, and support vector machines models. As I uh, previously, previously said, uh, the maximum accuracy for predicting user preferences regarding personalized input modalities with wearables were, um, was 85.3%. Um, uh, Based on these results, the wear skill is able to provide usage recommendations on combinations of uh, wearables and input modalities. Based on the user profile, as it is shown in the preference component of the application now on the screen. There are several directions um, we can proceed to extend our research, some of them already being addressed in other papers elaborated in our laboratory. We could extend wear skill to act as a middleware between wearables and output devices for people with motor impairments. We also can release wear skill as an open source application. And of course, we should evaluate the usability of wear skill. As a contributions, uh, I will summarize. Uh, we um, generate a set of software design requirements for input personalization and interchangeability with wearables. Um, we create a wear skill, which is a web-based application that implement uh, those requirements toward uh, personalized multi-device and multi-modality input. 
And uh, uh, finally, we set it up a study with uh, 21 people with motor impairments uh, showing uh, uh, more than 80% accuracy for predicting users' preferences for wearables. Thank you for your attention. And uh, if you have questions, I would be delighted to answer them. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, very timely with wearables uh, being very popular these days. Are there any questions? I think we have time for one question. Any questions I cannot see on the chat? Okay, maybe I can ask one question. So uh, when the initial set of requirements are created, uh, because I can see that these requirements yes. uh, evolved over time, uh, how were they created? Did you do a user study again with uh, motor impairment uh, users or uh, how were they created at the beginning or they were generated from the literature? Uh, yes. Um... Um, we partly um, based on uh, what uh, we found in a literary review and uh, also we uh, ask uh, people with motor impairments about their uh, needs in uh, using such a software application. Uh, we, uh, set it, we created this uh, application uh, as a way to enhance uh, the way people with motor impairments uh, uses uh, use technologies uh, such as a TV or a, a PC, a standard PC. Uh, they can control uh, those output devices with the help of uh, wearables. So uh, yes, it was a combination between uh, liter literature review and uh, and uh, let's say a uh, focus group with uh, people focus with motor group. impairment. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Very interesting research. I have uh, several questions, more questions, but I think we should move on to the next presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, you. If there are any questions, uh, I'm sure people will email you. So thanks for the presentation. Hi, thank you very much. Okay, so can we have the uh, next presenters, please? Okay, so the next uh, presentation, uh, the next paper is uh, titled Understanding the Touchscreen Based Non Visual Target Acquisition Task Performance of uh, Screen Reader Users. And uh, it's authored by Huan Zhou, Yang Jung Li, and Uran Oh. Uh, I guess Huan Zhou is presenting the paper. Yes, can you see my slide? Yes, we can, and we can hear you. So please uh, start. Yes. Hello, I am Huan Zhou. Um, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Okay. Hello, I am Huan Zhou, a master's student at Iwa Umasi University in South Korea. In this presentation, I will talk about how screen reader users perform target acquisition tests on a touch screen device. This work is done together with Yeon Jung Lee and Yurano. And recently, researchers studied touchscreen-based interactions for people with visual impairment to navigate element with an image. The explorer mode supported by Microsoft Sing AI is an ex example. It enables people with visual impairment to understand locations and sizes of elements by touching different regions on the screen with speech feedback. Detected. Move your finger over the screen to explore. Official. Volkswagen. Official. Vo Official. However, it is still difficult to locate an element on a touch screen without visual feedback, especially if the element is small. To understand how to better support touchscreen-based image exploration for people with visual impairment, we conducted a user study focusing on the effect of the following on their task performance. First, the size of the search space. Second, the screen target ratio. Third, 
the target locations. For the study, 12 screen reader users were recruited and they were asked to complete two tasks. The first one was finding a target at a random position on a screen as quickly as possible with touch to explore mode where swipe gestures were not allowed. We asked the participants to perform this task twice on different search spaces, large and medium, varying screen to target ratio, either 16 to one or 64 to one. This is the video showing how task one is done for each condition. To collect the data, we implemented a custom application for iOS devices with speech feedback. To simulate different screen size, we covered the rest of the inter interactive area of the screen other than the search space with a paper overlay. The search space was centered on the screen of the device to minimize the effect of physical bezels. From task one, we had several findings. Here, I will highlight the key findings. Please refer to the paper for more details. We first examined the task completion time. Another analysis confirmed that participants were faster with larger targets when the screen size is the same as expected. That is, the performance is better than the screen to target ratio is relatively big. We also found that participants were faster with a similar search space when the target size is the same. This also suggests that bigger screen to target ratio has a better performance. Moreover, we found that the participants were faster even when the target size is similar given the same screen to target ratio. This implies that having a smaller search space is more important than marking targets large. However, we also noted that a larger search space with higher screen to target ratio had a better performance when it is compared to the performance of the smaller search space with a very small target. This means that if the target size is too small, having a smaller search space has no positive impact on the task completion time. Likewise, even when the ratio is the same, if the target is too small, having a smaller search space did not outperform the one with the larger search space with the larger target. This trend was the same for the travel distance. Participants had a shorter travel distance with a larger target if the screen size is the same. In other words, a higher screen to target ratio has a better performance as shown here. The travel distance was also shorter for smaller search spaces, especially with a larger screen to target ratio when the target size is the same. In addition, participants had a shorter travel distance with a smaller search space for both types of screen to target ratios. However, the benefit of having smaller search space seemed negligible if the screen to target ratio is big. Indeed, P3 expressed his preference for high screen to target ratio, which is perceived to be space is efficient. He said, being small be means that you can put more stuff in the same space. It is, if so, it's better to use, use smaller space for the same amount of information because size is not important for blind people. Additionally, we also examined the first contact point to understand screen reader users' search behaviors. As shown here, we confirmed 
the participant starts searching from the top left corner regardless of the screen size. We also investigated how screen reader users search for targets on a touch screen. And we were able to identify that there were several patterns. The first one was zigzag as found in prior work. Also, we found that participants tend to start searching for targets near the borderline in a rectangle shape or in a spider shape. Repeat, pigtails as shown on the right were of observed as well. The rest parents were mostly combinations of more than one search parent, such as rectangle border first parent with zigzag, or rectangle border first with pigtail in combination of zigzag. The third finding was the identification of participant tracking parents into five parents. The novel retrievers treated as pigtail hybrid and border first consisting of rectangles and spiders. For each category, we assigned the frequency of use. We found that more than half of parents were zigzag. Ended our participants except P10 tried zigzag parent. The next popular search parent was border first used by eight out of 12 participants. We also had a second task where participants were asked to find a specific target with a level indicating its location. The target level was read out by the app at the beginning of each trial in a random order, and the participant's job was to find its locate by listening to the level of the currently focused target. The same apparatus was used but with more area covered compared to task one. This is demonstration of task two for each condition. Again, I will present the key findings from, for task two, starting with the task completion time. Similar to the findings from task one, participants were faster with larger targets when the screen size is the same, which has a bigger screen to target ratio. Similar to the findings from task one, participants were faster with similar search spaces when Similar to the finding from task one, when the target size is the same, a similar search space outperforms the larger one, even when the target location is no. However, this is only true when the target is not too small. We also investigated search parents. We assigned the first contacted cells for each target location and each condition. The figures show target ID on the y-axis and the first contacted target on the x-axis. Similar to task one, the participants would start searching for a target from the top left corner of the screen. Unlike the first task, we also observed that participants would directly point the target as the location is known. 
as shown here. We also asked for preferences. As a result, we found that most of participants preferred having targets placed without any gaps in between. When asked about the perceived difficulty of each condition, seven participants felt screen medium, target medium easier. Additionally, we asked preferred screen and target sizes again. Ten participants preferred a larger screen even when the performance was worse. Related, some participants said that it is difficult to perform gesture and get it recognized on a small screen. Based on the findings from both tasks, we have learned implications for designing efficient user interface for screen reader users. First, it is good practice to consider screen to target ratio. A larger target size or smaller search space does not always just guarantee better performance. Meanwhile, designing a space efficiency UI layout is recommended. One can either remove spacing between targets or use partial screen for exploring the miniature uh, yeah, version of the screen. Also similar to high graphical user interfaces were designed, we suggest placing important information from the top left corner of following the boundary of the screen for exploration if the location of the target is unknown. As a future work, we plan to study user modeling for screen reader users similar to feature low study. Also, we would like to investigate the performance benefits of different search parents that is have identified in this study. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you very much, Huayan, for, for a very nice presentation. Uh, are there any questions? Okay. In the meantime, I can comment that I'm looking forward to the performance modeling, especially something similar to Pete's law for screen reader users. That would be very interesting. I think that has not been done. Uh, we are looking forward to that part of your work. <laughs> um, I actually have a question about um, you know, you did the user study with the number of different users, screen reader users, but as we know, different users have different experiences in using their screen readers. How do you think their experiences affected, could or affect the results uh, that you had? Um, their expertise, how experienced they were in using the, uh, the speech output, let's say. Oh, I'm so, I'm so sorry, but could you write in down on the chat? Um, hi, I'm the one of the co-author of this paper. Okay. Let me answer that. So we did have half of the participants who are visually impaired, I mean, who have low vision and almost okay. half who are blind, totally blind. And we did not find any like, big differences, like statistical difference in terms of the logs we have collected. But we could observe that the prior experience with the screen readers do it change a lot. Like, but we, we will need to have more participants to actually see the big difference between the two user groups. I see. Maybe follow up studies could investigate yes. that. And one of the reviewers mm -hmm. also had a question uh, Do you think the different types of visual impairments affect the design suggestions? Uh, can you comment on that? A follow up question. Yes. Uh, we do believe that. It should be designed a different way. I mean, even, even if they are low vision, the severity is different. Even they're all blind, whether they're born blind or whether blind became blind later in their life, there's huge difference. So we we in this study we just assume that everyone are screen reader users, but we believe that's the way to go. Like having different customization for different types of visual impairments or different the severity levels should be also considered considered so if they're visually yeah. impaired or if they're blind uh, screen reader users you think that they should be considered in the yes so we hope to bring that aspect that attribute to our model as well if we okay. can make a so, physical model yes it sounds very interesting are there any questions from our uh, participants 
Okay, maybe I can ask one last question. Um, so regarding the patterns, they were also very interesting, like zigzag patterns starting from left and uh, the, the direction of interaction. Uh, do you think the language would have an effect on that, the, especially the direction moving from left to right um, or the way they are used to having certain directions? Do you think that would have an influence on the patterns? Uh, that's a nice question. And the all the participants we had were Korean, where they mm -hmm. are used to reading from left to right. Uh, mm -hmm. If it's Japanese, I believe they're reading from right to left. So if that's the participant we recruited from, then I maybe their search behavior might change. Maybe from the top right corner, maybe. So maybe you can have follow-up studies for your work. Yeah, but I don't know the answer yet. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you very much. I guess there are thank no you. more questions. So thanks for the very nice presentation. And as I said, looking forward to your modeling work. Thank you very much. Uh, before we move on to the next presentation, I think Dragon would like to make an announcement. Dragon? Yes, here I am. Uh, so just to um, remind you for the accessibility challenge that we will have the videos posted on Slack channel. So please check them and vote for the accessibility challenge. So that is pretty much it. And um, yes, that's it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. thank you very much, Dragon. So we can move on to the next presentation, which is a communication paper. Uh, the paper is titled The Deployment Framework Image, a deployment framework for creating multimodal experiences of web graphics. Uh, the authors are uh, Julieta uh, Regimbal, uh, Jeffrey Blum, and Jeremy Cooperstock. And uh, this presentation will be a recorded one. Uh, can I ask our student uh, volunteer to share it, please? Thank you, Shuming. And uh, there will be, uh, Jeremy, I guess, will be here for the uh, questions at the end. Yep, you can start it. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Juliet Regenbaugh, and I'm presenting Image, a deployment framework for creating multimodal experiences of web graphics. And before I begin, I just want to note that there will be some spatialized audio in a few minutes. So if you have headphones available, I highly recommend you put them on. So this work is really motivated by a few main points. The first being that alt text on the web is often missing or incomplete. And alt text when present needs to be brief. So it's very good at giving a high level perspective of an image. For example, that this photo in the upper right is of a busy city street, but it doesn't really capture details. Those details may be best conveyed using a multimodal approach, um, using different modalities like non-speech audio or haptics. And multimodal approaches like these have been very useful in improving web accessibility and systems and tools have been developed to automatically create these multimodal renderings of, of various kinds of graphics. But these systems tend to be a bit focused on one kind of scenario. So one kind of graphic transformed in one way to produce one kind of rendering. And uh, as part of the image project, we needed to produce a variety um, of kind, kinds of renderings. So we were looking for an open source platform that can support uh, a variety of situations easily. Situations like um, a, encountering a graphic that is uh, this photo in the upper right corner, but also um, an embedded map or a pie chart of COVID data. And then th conveying that as uh, non-speech or spatialized audio, but also using the sense of touch. So something like um, kinesthetic haptics that can guide a user's hand across the image or a raised pin array. So we quickly realized that um, we would need to make our own platform to do this uh, the way we wanted. And we wanted to make a platform that can be extended and used by other people for their own kinds of uh, goals. So what I'm hoping to show today is how you can use the image architecture for your own purposes by going through this example, uh, the busy city street and how the image framework uh, can be used to transform it into a spatialized audio rendering. One that indicates the 
large regions of this image and um, plays an au a spatialized audio uh, rendering of the, the outline of each, and then goes through the objects and, and plays a spatialized pin to indicate their position in the image and also their size. And that rendering sounds like this. This outdoor photo contains the following outlines of regions, building, car, and signboard. It also contains the following objects or people, six people, two umbrellas, two traffic lights, four cars, a bus, and a backpack. So without further ado, let's talk about the approach with image a little bit. So uh, the architecture really consists of two parts, um, a client and our implementation, a browser extension that gets data on the graphic being encountered and then sends that data to a server where that server will then process that data to get more useful information. Uh, and then we'll have all of that data used to synthesize a set of renderings. Uh, and those renderings are then sent back from the server to the client um, so that they can be displayed to the user. And this is um, obviously a uh, simplification and the actual image architecture looks more like this. The server is expanded to include three main types of modules. Um, and this may seem a little overwhelming at first, but I'm going to be stepping through all of this and all of these modules. And I also just want to note that all of these modules are Docker services communicating with each other over HTTP uh, with one exception that I will point out when we get there. So. Let's start at the beginning. The client, the browser extension, a user encounters this photo on the web and wants to get multimodal representations of it. So uh, the client will produce a blob uh, containing data about it shown on the left. And that JSON blob will contain some generic information about the request itself, a UUID, um, a timestamp it was produced at, the page it was produced from, then some information about the graphic. So uh, the actual blob of the image itself, uh, its dimensions, the image tag it was contained in on the page, and then some uh, more image specific information. Um, so a set of capabilities, which um, are different uh, user preferences or available haptic hardware used to um, determine what kind of renderings can be produced. Uh, in this case, default options and no haptic hardware. And then a list of renderers, which are these data formats um, that the client supports to uh, actually display um, renderings as. So as text, as a simple audio file that can be played through, and as a segmented audio file with annotations allowing the user to go to specific meaningful segments. Um, and all of this information is sent to the server where it first goes to an orchestrator. So this orchestrator validates the data that comes in and then looks for uh, the other modules that will need to be run. So those modules are either preprocessors, uh, which do that processing task, or handlers that do the synthesis work. And um, all of these preprocessors and handlers are found by looking for running containers that have either a preprocessor or handler label. And once the orchestrator uh, gets all of these, it will then start um, sending the data to the preprocessors, where each of these preprocessors are wrapped around something like a machine learning model or a third party service, something to get more information about uh, this data that was collected. And each preprocessor also includes a priority number that indicates uh, the order in which it should run and an output format, which um, is advertised so that other preprocessors and handlers can actually use the data it produces. So in our example, uh, that collected data from the client is first sent to um, a content categorizer, which identifies this as being a photograph, and a map information preprocessor, which quickly realizes that this isn't a map. So it exits almost immediately with um, a code indicating that it can produce no content for this. Next, it will move on to this uh, graphic tagger in the second group, which has access to that content categorizer information to realize, well, this is a photograph I can run, 
And when it runs, it realizes that this is an outdoor photo. So after that runs, all of that data from the first and second group are sent to this uh, third group of a semantic segmentation preprocessor and an object detection preprocessor, which find um, regions and objects in this photo. So after all of the preprocessors run, all of this data and the data from the client are sent to a set of handlers, which can use these other uh, Docker containers called services um, to perform uh, very like general tasks that are replicated across all of these handlers. And in this example, uh, the handler does two, uses two of these services. So that data comes in uh, from the preprocessors and um, is used to generate text describing the image. So something like this outdoor photo contains the following outlines of regions, etc. And that text is then sent over HTTP to this TTS service which will convert um, these text segments into speech, the, the speech you heard earlier. That is sent back to the handler, where um, that information is used to annotate uh, the data it's already produced. And all of that is then sent over OSC, Open Sound Control, to a Super Collider service. And OSC is just used here because Super Collider doesn't support HTTP. And the Super Collider service will then um, generate additional non-speech audio, those uh, spatialized outlines and, and pings that you heard earlier. And then we'll spatialize um, all of this audio, um, the ones it, genera it generates and uh, the others, and sends all of that back to the handler where it's used to create renderings and uh, return it. So that all of that data then goes back to the client where the renderings are displayed. So that text description is shown, but then also there is the audio uh, you heard earlier with those annotations. So a user can open a drop down menu and select, well, I wanna hear where the cars are in this image. So I click here and then I can hear the cars or go to the people. So, um, I hope this helped uh, sh uh, show you how you can use the image architecture uh, for your own work. If you want to learn more about image, uh, please visit our website at image.a11y.migil.ca, where you can find our browser extension um, and our repositories, one for the browser extension licensed under the GPL, and one for all of the server components that were discussed here today and more, which are licensed under the AGPL. Thank you. Um, thanks for the presentation, for this recorded presentation. Juliet, uh, I guess, available here for the questions? Uh, yes. Right Hi, here. Juliet. Uh, Hi. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, are there any questions? Okay, maybe I, I can start. So, uh, as far as I can see from your presentation, you have a very open architecture. So different components, so they can be replaced with, I guess, different implementations. So, so far, uh, which are the uh, available, for example, preprocessors that you have experimented with, or have you not done that? Uh, I'm, I'm just curious. Uh, so, so far we have um, a good set, a set of different ones. Um, we have, uh, most of them are oriented towards um, uh, photographs. So we have um, the object detection and semantic segmentation ones that were mentioned. Um, we also had experimented with um, overall scene description uh, um, machine learning models, but ended up having um, issues integrating them uh, into in a uh, comprehensive way. Uh, and then we also are using some other um, services for uh, maps. So for, so for maps, we're connecting to both um, Google Maps in order to get additional information on uh, any embedded maps that are encountered. And we also are querying um, a server from another project that um, our lab has done called uh, Otua, um, which is used to get um, point of interest information uh, and other data aggregated from, uh, I believe, uh, Foursquare and uh, OpenStreetMaps. Uh, and we're planning on expanding that uh, to focus on um, embedded charts uh, over the next uh, few months as well. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, very nice to see, of course, an open architecture that can be experimented with different kinds of services. Uh, Donald has a question. Uh, he says, perhaps I missed this, but could you explain how you choose the sounds and what influenced the sound design for the app? Um, so the sound designs uh, were 
uh, are still in a somewhat um, testing phase. We have um, iterated on them through uh, interviews and panel testing with um, blind and uh, partially sighted participants. Um, however, uh, they haven't been fully validated, but um, most of uh, essentially the large, uh, the big picture um, approach we've taken to the sound design is to uh, try and use um, different, uh, try, try and use specific uh, synth effects that are able to be um, better uh, conveyed spatially using uh, ambisonics. Um, so uh, especially when we don't know exactly which um, uh, headphones might be used or what, um, or especially not the uh, specific head related transfer function of each user. So um, we've really um, tried to keep an eye towards um, making sure that the sounds are as um, are as like broad um, as possible while still being, uh, you know, while still having enough uh, space to convey information through uh, the timbre of the different um, sounds and the pitch and, and et cetera. But it is still very much a work in progress. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to ask one more question. I see no, no other questions on the chat. Uh, so this work is targeting being a multimodal presentation. So you show us that the experiment, you are experimenting with non-speech audio. Uh, are you also doing experiments with other modalities or yeah. focusing on sound? Yes, um, we are. Uh, we have spent um, quite a bit of time working on integrating uh, haptics as well. So mm -hmm. um, some of my uh, colleagues have been working on integrating a um, well, two of those devices that were shown um, in in the presentation: the uh, two-dimensional uh, force feedback pantograph um, and the and uh, a uh, various raised pin arrays. However, those are. Um, the designs for those are still in progress uh, and um, haven't been uh, nearly as finalized as the audio. It, it's been harder to, uh, we, we, for a lot of these, we've essentially had to rewrite the drivers um, for them in, in JavaScript uh, so that we're able to um, control them from the browser. So unfortunately that's caused a bit of a, a delay between the audio design being uh, in a usable state and, and the haptics. I can imagine, but looking forward to other modalities as well. So thanks for the presentation. Thank you very Thank much. You. Um, we have uh, two more uh, papers, two technical papers to continue. Uh, the first one is eight, uh, automatic and accessible image descriptions for review imagery in online retail. Uh, the paper is authored by Rahana Sritar, Nicola Tan, Jungjuang Zhang, Kim Jing, Spencer Gregson, Gregson Niveta Samudrella, Eli Morata Feliz, and Shrenik Sadalki. Uh, so, uh, can we have the presentation shared, please? Yes, sure. One second. Nicole Tan will be presenting. And can you see that okay? And hear me okay? Yeah, 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 I can. Cool. Uh, so we'll get started. Thank you very much. Yeah, please. Of course. Um, hi, and nice to meet y'all. My name is Nicole, and we'd like to welcome you to our technical paper talk for AID, an automatic image description engine for review imagery. Uh, Rashna and I, uh, who will be presenting today, are creative technologists at Wayfair. So reviews play an important role when a customer shops online. Think about the last time you bought a large furniture item online. You likely look through the product images, read through the description of the product, including specifications like the size and the weight of the item, and then scroll down to look through the reviews. Review imagery is a critical way to showcase products in real life context, helping customers see details about a product that may not be apparent in stage product imagery or in verbiage on the product page. In fact, in a survey conducted by Bazaar Voice in 2021, 66% of customers found that review photos played an important role in helping them make purchasing decisions. 75% preferred user submitted content over stage imagery because they felt it lent products an air of authenticity. And finally, 59% of consumers consider visual information more important than textual information. While browsing through web pages with a screen reader, visually impaired shoppers rely on alternative text, which is also known as alt text, and that's a written description of the content of an image. However, alt text can be sparse because it's often written manually by a human. In cases where there's higher alt text coverage, these image, these image descriptions tend to lack useful information as they may be created by some sort of generic rule-based system. 
This means visually impaired shoppers will lose out on important information that can influence their purchasing decisions. Some examples of alt text for review photos can be seen here. In the top left image, the alt text is simply customer image, which tells the BLV shopper nothing about the gray sleeper that's shown in the corresponding image. The alt text for the top middle image simply says summary of review, which can be confusing for a customer to read because the photo is simply not a summary of the review. Other examples of low quality alt text can be seen on the remainder of this page, like object object and the name of the product. These can all lead to frustrating experiences for those who are visually impaired, as they may listen to a series of these repetitive alt texts without knowing what's actually contained in the images. To guide the design of our prototype, we set out to understand the current challenges and needs of blind and low vision shoppers um, who are shopping online for home items by conducting an initial user study. As we didn't find prior work on the alt text needs of visually impaired people while shopping online for furniture, we sent out a survey to gather initial quantitative data. We recruited adult participants from the Carroll Center for the Blind who had prior experience using a screen reader and had partial or complete blindness. 54 visually impaired participants ended up answering our survey. All participants mentioned that they usually browse through reviews while shopping online, but 88% selected missing alt text of an image as the biggest challenge. This confirms the current state of alt text and the magnitude of the challenges faced by blind and low vision people. To understand what features of alt text blind or low vision shoppers wanted to hear in review imagery, we conducted an initial moderated study with seven visually impaired people over Zoom. Participants were first asked about their previous experiences with accessibility on retail sites. We then pre-selected a popular retail site and chose two SOFA web pages. Participants browsed through the web pages of these products while verbalizing their thoughts out loud. After browsing, they were asked about the role of review images in their shopping experience, and they then ranked the importance of including certain features about review photos in the alt text. As no previous work had been found on the usefulness of alt text for review photos in e-commerce furniture shopping, the study helped us to focus in on crafting descriptions that would accurately serve the needs of those listening to them. From this investigation, we learned that participants generally had an anything is better than nothing approach towards alt text for review photos. Most review imagery ended up lacking alt text and this caused frustration for participants. When ranking review photo features to be included in the alt text, participants found that the most important content would be the product's color, followed by any unique features of the product, which they described as things like the patterns on the material or the shape of the sofa followed by a description of the room, and finally, a high-level overview of the image. We'll, we'll now speak more about the system that we created from these findings. With the findings from the empirical study in mind, we created AID, which stands for an Automatic Image Description Engine. AID takes a review photo and its corresponding comments and automatically generates all text for the review image. At a high level, AID consists of two modules working in parallel. One generates a description of the scene in a review image, and the other parses the review comment for product specific features. These outputs are combined using GPT-3 to create alt text that provides context and is human readable. Because the color of the product had been determined to be the most important feature in our empirical study, we employed an object attribute model because it usually identifies the color of the product. In instances where it doesn't, the parsing of the review comment can then supplement or augment this result. The scene description module provides descriptions of the setting and its contents in the image, both of which are ranked highly in the empirical study. We focus on capturing the context of the scene automatically for each image in a two-step process using computer vision and machine learning. We first detect key objects in the scene with a Vineville object attribute detection model. We obtain the regions and tags for each object detected. These results are fed into an image captioning model that uses a vision and language framework called OSCAR to tie together visual features and language elements. And this model ends up outputting human readable sentences. Within the review text processing module, we augment results from scene description with data parsed from the reviewer's comments to obtain more comprehensive alt text, including features that the image processing module might have missed. We employed a series of in-house named entity recognition models to parse semantically relevant keywords from the unstructured review text and then associate these keywords to predefined topics. The implemented models were based off of the bidirectional LSTM CNN neural network architecture. And finally, we then leverage GPT-3 to combine the phrases from scene description and the keywords from review text parsing to generate human readable alt text. I'll now hand it off to Rashna to speak more about the results. Thanks, Nicole. So moving on to results. You can find some examples of eight generated descriptions here. The purple highlights of the text refer to data points obtained from the scene description module. The gray highlights refer to information that has been parsed from the text parsing module. 
For example, in the image on the top left, you can see that information about key objects and the setting is extracted from the scene description module, which is highlighted in purple. It mentions that the scene has large windows in the living room and that the couch is in the living room. Our empirical investigation had noted that the importance of giving a description of the context, which this example shows. <clears throat> In addition, the text parsing module extracts product specific color information from the text, augmenting the scene description output by saying that the color of the couch is blue. This also follows the wants of visually impaired shoppers in our empirical study, who noted the importance of mentioning the product color in the alt text. In another example, like in the image on the top right, you can see that the scene description module correctly identifies that the image is zoomed in is a zoomed in photo of a chair. You can also, um, and it also talks about the contents of the image. You can see some failure cases in the bottom row where the object detection algorithm doesn't identify items in the scene or the named entity recognition models for text parsing don't extract keywords correctly. Next, we'll talk about the technical evaluation that we did to analyze the accuracy of it. <clears throat> We evaluated the accuracy of the generated alt text with human QA. Two cited colleagues each rated 75 alt texts against their corresponding images. These are the metrics that we asked the raters to, to evaluate aid against. A, the raters compared aid alt text with existing alt text on site and selected the better image descriptor. B, the alt text should describe the scene in detail to quantify this, the raters counted the number of distinct items correctly described in the alt text that are also present in the image. And C, in our empirical study, we had found that participants wanted descriptive adjectives about objects. We quantified this by having the raters count the number of features for each correctly identified object. Indeed, finally, the raters were asked to approve or reject the alt text. To ensure accurate information is conveyed, we asked raters to approve aid or text only if all images, if all items described were present and had the mentioned features in the image. Coming to a couple of our results, 74% of aid or text was approved, meaning that all objects in the alt text were present in the image and correctly described. Aid also captures 73% of distinct items present in an image. And finally, aid was selected as a better descriptor 85% of the time over the current alt text on site. Only 16% of aid alt text included an M object that wasn't in the image. Um, moving on to our evaluative study. We conducted hour long moderated interviews with 18 visually impaired participants over Zoom to understand if age generated alt text was engaging, understandable, and if it helped participants feel more included and independent in the e-commerce context. Participants were told that they were, were told to imagine that they were looking to purchase a new couch and had narrowed it down to two options that we had pre-selected for them. <clears throat> they then browsed each web page like they normally would. When they got to the review section, we asked them to switch to a Google form. The Google form had one section for each product. Within the section, we provided randomly sampled seven to eight reviews for that product. And each review contained the star rating, the review text, and the photo with the age generated alt text. You can see an example of the Google form over here on the right. After reading each review, participants were asked if they understood the contents of the above image given the alt text. After reading all reviews, they were asked two questions. The first was, if more images had alt text, I would want to listen to them. The second was, do you feel like you have all information on site to understand or learn about the product? <clears throat> After they completed the sections for both products, they were asked to rate if online shopping would be more accessible with this alt text and the likeliness of their recommending turning it on to other visually impaired people. We'll speak a bit and we'll speak in a bit about more detail about the results of our evaluative study now. Participants reported that they wanted to continue engaging with age generated alt text, with most saying they would continue to listen to it if given the opportunity to. 
Some mentioned that they wanted as much information as possible to make an informed decision. Others noted that aid descriptions were more useful, more helpful, and more interesting, and contrasted this experience with previous feelings of dis disengagement and frustration on other sites, where they felt left out of the conversation. Additionally, we found that 83% of participants reported that aid created a more inclusive shopping environment. 15 out of 18 were likely to recommend turning on aid to others. The majority of participants spoke about their typical online shopping experience, and they said that they, it usually included the assistance of, sight, of a sighted person. Some noted how aid made them feel more independent, saying, I can get all the information I need, and I don't have to rely on other people to make an informed decision about what I'm trying to buy. Overall, participants felt aid provided a more accessible means of shopping online, a stark contrast from their previous frustrations with all text on most retail sites. Finally, let's talk about takeaways. <clears throat> Review imagery plays an important role for online retail, but lack of alt text poses accessibility challenges for visually impaired shoppers. Our empirical studies reveal the most critical facets to describe and review imagery, product-specific color, unique features, as well as a description of the product's context of the images context. We created AID, a multimodal system to generate descriptions for visual imagery. From our technical evaluation, AID has been proven to accurately describe distinct items and their features in review imagery. In our evaluative studies, 83% reported that AID created a more inclusive shopping online environment and that they were very likely to recommend turning on AID to others. Other findings validated that aid increased the feelings of independence in visually impaired people and was engaging to users. Finally, thank you for listening to our talk. We have a couple of minutes for questions now. Thank I you see. very much. Thank you very much. Thanks for this nice presentation. Uh, we have a question on the chat. Uh, it says, alt text is supposed to be approximately 140 characters. Have you found it challenging to stay within those parameters and still provide accurate alt text? Um, I can take this one, Nicole. Um, yes, sometimes we did find it challenging. We haven't yet deployed this um, on site, but most of the time, uh, and we haven't done a, a technical evaluation of this, but most of the time we found it was pretty short, maybe um, coming within two or three sentences. Okay, you just mentioned that you haven't done a technical evaluation. Can you elaborate on that? Um, and what's your plan? Oh, um, I meant we haven't done an analysis of how long the final aid generated descriptions usually are. Okay. Um, that is, yes. Um, but that's something we plan to do when we deploy this on site. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Are there any other questions? Uh, there is actually one nice question from the reviewers. Uh, so the question is, what are the ethical implications of this work, knowing that the generated alt text can influence people's shopping, shopping behaviors? What do you think about this question? <laughs> That's a very good question. Um, yeah, and it's something we have to be careful uh, when we're before deploying this on site. And one way of doing this is to um, have a human in the loop to sort of manually approve the alt text. Um, another is to also have the, the, um, the people who put up these reviews, have them themselves approve the alt text and sort of give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Um, Nicole, do you wanna add anything? No, I agree with that completely. Yeah, having, you know, the reviewer be the one to then approve it will hopefully kind of mitigate some of the, the concerns about the ethical implications of, you know, saying that, you know, this is the best couch to buy, for instance. Yeah. Thank you very much. They, Walker asked a question. Walker says, have you compared the quality of your descriptions with those generated by Microsoft Azure uh, caption bot? We haven't, but we didn't come across this in our literature study. Um, so our prototype differs from this in that this is our prototype is customized for review imagery and it, it also incorporates the review text to, all, to finally augment the final descriptions. Um, but we haven't done a direct comparison now. 
Okay, thank you. I think it will be interesting to see a comparison as well. Uh, Amy also asked, do you think alt text should be very different depending on whether it's an e-commerce scenario or another context? Actually, I wanted to ask a similar question uh, because uh, you are focusing on reviews. Uh, the context is reviews, but how about the other context? Uh, is it really different? Nicole, do you want to take this? Yeah, sure. Um, so this had also come up um, in our literature study, and we had found that there had been a couple of studies that showed that source specific context was basically crucial for creating good alt text, and that's what the visually impaired folks had said, um, which is why then when we had discovered this, that despite the fact that, you know, there might have been some studies on, you know, the implications of alt text on, you know, newspaper sites, for instance, um, we thought that our use case was a little different. So we went about conducting our studies to figure out review imagery, particularly within the e-commerce context so that we could provide the most accurate and useful descriptions uh, for folks who are browsing on sites. Yeah. So if you would like to apply this to another context, what else do you think you need to do? I mean, what kind of other studies you need to do to uh, deploy it in another context? Um, and I can take that if that's okay. So an example that kind of comes to mind for a different context is we're, we're specifically looking at the furniture context um, for e-commerce. So our mm -hmm. model wouldn't work directly with, let's say, if you're looking for clothing on a site, um, for instance. So we'd have to um, ensure that our model is trained for, for those specific use cases, in which case then it would then work. Um, the same framework would work for, for a different retail context, for instance. Okay. So asking Thank Nicole's you. point, we can also see what other kinds of data that we can use because here with review imagery, we're, we're using review text to augment it. With clothing, there might be other types of data we might possibly be able to use. Okay. Thank you very much. I see no other questions on the chat as well. So thank you very much. Very nice work. Uh, looking forward to uh, see the follow up of your study in the future. Thanks for your presentation. Uh, we can move to the last presentation of this session. Uh, it's a technical paper, and as I uh, mentioned at the beginning of the session, it's a uh, paper nominated for uh, Best Technical Paper Award. Um, the paper is uh, the title of the paper is uh, Sound Cells, Designing a Browser-Based Music Technology for Braille and Print Notation. Uh, it's authored by William Payne, Fabiha Ahmed, uh, Michael Gardel, Luca Dubias, and Amy Hurst. Uh, it will be a recorded presentation, and William will be here uh, afterwards for the Q&A session. Uh, please start the presentation. This project is titled Sound Cells, Designing a Browser-Based Music Technology for Braille and Print Notation. I'm Willie Payne. I'm a PhD candidate in music technology at New York University. I'm a skinny white guy with short black hair and glasses wearing light, loose clothing. My co-authors are Fabiha Ahmed, Mike Gardell, Amy Hurst, and Luc Dubois. We come from a range of backgrounds, but we're all part of the Ability Project an interdisciplinary research group at NYU that works at the intersection between disability and technology. In this talk, I'll describe the need and motivation that led to sound cells development and share a demo. Then I'll describe how sound cells was designed with two experienced blind musicians and briefly evaluated with five others. Finally, I'll discuss what we learned, especially pertaining to sound cells inputs and outputs and point to some exciting directions for future research. So music, of course, is mainly experienced through sound. However, music notations use other mediums like print or braille. In the figure, there's one measure of music displayed three ways in standard print notation, in large print, which is much bigger and uses custom fonts, spacing, and layouts, and braille music, a standard encoding read by many blind musicians. While each of these forms of notation exists, publishers and online databases only provide music in standard PDF image formats. So the burden of acquiring the music one reads can often fall on blind musicians. Fortunately, a lot of great research and technology over the last few years has explored how to expand access to accessible music notations, especially through scanning and file conversion. 
Um, however, still converting a print score to Braille can be a time consuming and intensive process dependent on multiple pieces of software. Typically, one or more sighted people scan or copy a score using music notation software, export it to a standard encoding like Music XML, and convert that to Braille using a conversion script like Goodfeel or Sal My Braille. Finally, they send it to a Braille music expert to tweak layout, improve legibility and accuracy, and make corrections. Visionability is necessary for copying the print score, while Braille expertise is necessary for finalizing the Braille score. I've worked as a transcriber for more than two years, helping produce scores for blind and visually impaired learners, so I'm very familiar with this workflow. More research to date has studied how to make existing scores available in Braille or large print. Rather than understand the needs and workflows of blind musicians who notate new music. A lot of commercial music software is highly visual using graphic user interfaces and what you see is what you get interactions. On the left, I'm using a mouse to add notes and drag musical symbols within the notation software Lime. On the right is the music notation view inside the digital audio workstation Logic next to a long list of musical events. These tools and others are very complicated and can pose accessibility barriers to blind and visually impaired musicians. So this brings us to sound cells, which I'll now present in a brief demo. Sound cells is a music notation software available for free in browsers. It uses a syntax called ABC to input notes and other musical symbols and renders scores in both print and braille notation in real time. The entire page is keyboard navigable and designed to be used with a screen reader. The main interface consists of a text editor, button to display the score and braille music notation, audio playback controls, and a visual rendering of the score. On the left is a bunch of documentation to get started, including a tutorial and some example excerpts like the Mario theme you can listen to and remix. Currently, I've begun a score named it a nice tune, set its meter to 4-4, and its key to B flat. I've also filled in two measures of music. By pressing command shift space, we can hear them played back. Great, let's complete this tune by adding a couple more notes and bar lines. Each of the letters I just typed, G, F, G, A, were notes. Sound cells played each one right as I typed them. Let's add our last note and a double bar line. Okay, I think I've finished this phrase, but I see a yellow underline below the fourth measure, so it looks like something is wrong. If I hover over the measure, it tells me it's underfilled, meaning it's not long enough. I can also press Command Shift M to open a diagnostics list that can be navigated with a keyboard. I'll fix this by adding a quarter note rest to the end. OK, let's play the whole thing back. Sounds good. By pressing Command Shift 9, I can display the Braille music. While focused with an external Braille display connected, a user can navigate the Braille music score line by line. There's also a settings menu where I can change some properties of the music. For example, if we wanted to make a large print version of the score, we might increase the size of the notation and also change the paper orientation and size to be landscape and 11 by 17 or A3. Finally, when we're ready, we can download the score. SoundCell supports a few different file types. An ABC text file can be easily shared, for example, copied into a body of an email, 
a Braille file can be embossed, a PDF can be printed, and a music XML file can be opened in virtually any other music notation software, meaning projects started in sound cells can be continued in other commercial tools. So I'll click download, and I'll drag into view our new print score, a nice tune. We co-designed sound cells with two blind musicians, one an expert in braille music and the other familiar with a wide range of music software. In the first meeting, they tried an early prototype that converted ABC text to braille music, and they expressed interest in pursuing the concept. The results of this first meeting are shared in a poster at Assets. The latter three meetings, held remotely over two months, were loosely guided by recent additions to the interface and were wide ranging. A lot of this work was also done asynchronously. The co-designers tried sound cells on their own and shared ideas. From co-design, we determined the layout of the interface and the available keyboard shortcuts for navigation and for querying text-to-speech feedback. Following co-design, we conducted a remote design probe with five other blind musicians resembling the first co-design meeting. Most were less familiar with music technology and some had never used music notation software before. Each session included a 30 minute guided exploration of sound cells in which participants learned to write notes and simple rhythms and were tasked with completing a short recognizable tune. Then we asked participants to describe their experience, reflect on whether or how it may fit into their workflows, and brainstorm potential improvements and features. All co-designers and participants expressed enthusiasm about sound cells. Many especially liked how it played back the music as they typed. All were able to independently compose a short, simple tune with just a little bit of instruction. We organize our findings into three themes, text input, multimodal output, and interface accessibility. First, we saw a striking difference between co-designers and participants and how they engaged with text. In the first co-design meeting, each expert improvised and wrote new material. Participants, in contrast, stuck to getting their tune to sound correct. In general, co-designers expressed little concern about learning and memorizing syntax, wanting support for as much notation as possible, while participants felt syntax could get confusing and suggested UI features for aiding the editing process, like a symbol selector menu. These contrasting experiences suggest that going forward, we may need to balance designs that lower the floor for novices while raising the ceiling for experts. Second, participants used a combination of outputs, including music, text-to-speech, and Braille for feedback as they edited. On multiple occasions, we witnessed a participant detect a mistake through hearing the music or feeling the Braille score. We also saw a range of assistive technology setups being used. For example, some participants only used screen readers, while one co-designer used a Braille display with audio often disabled. Thus, we need to ensure that sound cells is accessible regardless of the assistive technology available, but also ensure that if multiple output modalities are available, they support rather than clash with each other. Finally, participants appreciated how simple the website was to navigate and found the interface accessible and intuitive, but there were some issues. The coding editor we used introduced a significant bug for voiceover users that was not detected earlier because our co-designers used JAWS and NVDA. Additionally, some participants tried sound cells on mobile devices and Braille displays and reported mixed results. Because input in sound cells centers around the QWERTY keyboard, support for other platforms would require significant design consideration. While research to date validates the sound cells concept, participants have largely engaged with it through short guided activities. To further explore the design of text input and multimodal outputs, we intend to deploy sound cells in a much longer study where participants compose their own music. Additionally, we found through co-design that a major benefit of text was how easy it made sharing music, especially works in progress over email. We'd like to explore how sound cells is used in collaboration, 
especially to support mixed vision environments in which musicians all read their own forms of notation. So thank you so much for your time. You can try sound cells at soundcells.herokuapp.com. I'd like to thank the Ability Project, Vertically Integrated Projects, and the Philemon M. D'Agostino Greenberg Music School for their ongoing support. Thank you very much. Uh, Willie is here to answer questions. Uh, are there any questions? Um, Willie, can you give us more details about the future work of this work, you know, for sound cells, so we can see that people liked it, and uh, uh, especially in the music school that you've been collaborating with, uh, how are their reactions, and how are you planning to continue with this work? Yeah, absolutely. And the... I know you gave us some overview at the end of the recorded presentation, but would be mm. nice to get more details. Yeah, so th there, there is a follow-up study. I, I, I won't share too, too much about it. Um, but yeah, the kind of next step was running a music composition class and giving it to people to compose their own scores and having that culminate in a final performance. So they're using it uh, to co compose music, which is very exciting. Um, I will say, I guess one of the kind of interesting things about that and combining some of those last couple points, and one of the things that's unique about sound cells is that because they're notating music in text, which is kind of similar, right, to writing a document in, in, in law tech and then generating a PDF, we've been able to explore things like a musician who only reads braille music composing a score for a musician who reads large print music and then performing it. So because they have this kind of shared language, um, and in, this includes me, we have this kind of shared language and text. Um, we can then share music that way, but then ultimately generate a score that we can read in a notation that, that makes sense for us, um, which is kind of cool. Thank you very much. There is one question in, yes. on the chat. Uh, in your presentation, you mentioned hovering over the error. How well does this aspect work with screen readers and for keyboard only users? It's a great question. So, and I didn't demo this in that video. There's also um, question mark commands or tell me commands. This is a feature we go into the paper. So if you type a question mark and then followed by a corresponding letter, you can sort of query your musical score. So if you type a question mark and then the letter M, it will give you information about that current measure. So it will read to you the same uh, the same information that that happened when I hovered over that uh, hovered over the measure. Um, and then the same thing if you type uh, if you open that diagnostics tab. Um, then you can navigate through that entirely with a keyboard and your screen will read back to you any syntax errors you have or any duration rhythm errors that you have. Um, so there, there are ways of accessing all of that information sort of both through screen reader and through visual feedback, but certainly in more of the future work, I think we're interested in um, if you're using a screen reader, are you getting that information when you want to? Is it annoying to have to type that command so often? Could it give it to you um, automatically when you make the error in the first place? So th there's a lot more still to explore. So a lot more to explore, I guess, in terms of features as well, because you showed us some commercial tools that are available. So compared to those commercial tools, what are the other features that can be added, you think, in feature to sound cells? Yep. Um, it's, it's interesting, and this goes a little bit to the point I made at the beginning too, and that expert musicians have, have certain needs and new users also have certain needs. So the, the kind of biggest thing that commercial software can do is you can make any kind of musical score, um, any, you know, for full orchestra with all kinds of musical symbols, very, very complicated music. And currently sound cells can't do that. So sound cells is somewhat limited to single instrument pieces with very few musical symbols. So the sort of, 
thing that it can do right now is you can start a score and then you can export the music XML and open it into a commercial tool. The thing that sound cells can do that none of those other, for the most part, none of those other tools can do is that in one package in real time, you can generate braille music and you can create print music and you don't need to go through all of these complicated steps um, that otherwise you would need to do with, with those other tools. So it kind of solves this issue around producing music across modalities, but you know, it, it's developed by a small team um, so it's, not... it's and, it, and it's also a challenge for all of us, I guess, right? Including more features, not make it complicated for uh, novice users. It's all it's always a, a trade off, I guess. Uh, there is one more question from Donald. Uh, can it also print ABC notation? Some music genres, for example, Irish uses this notation. Yep, um, and and Donald, see, this is a great question, and you're familiar <laughs> with ABC notation. So we, so ABC is not a notation that we invented. ABC notation is a language that's been around for I think 20 years or so. It's been around for a while, and it's especially used for notating folk music. So we chose it in part because there are these big online repositories of of music in ABC, especially folk tunes and, and Irish tunes. Um, and by having that support, we could very quickly create new scores in Braille, um, which is something that takes a lot of work otherwise. So yep, yeah, so you can export your ABC score. The other benefit of it being raw ABC text is you can just copy and paste it into the body of an email. Um, SoundCells does some a couple of extra fancy things behind the scenes, which is that if you download the ABC score, it will download a version that doesn't have any syntax errors and includes kind of some extra header information. Um, so there's a couple ways um, that you can get the ABC notation. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting work. Uh, I guess we can um, close the session. Uh, so good luck with the uh, best paper nomination. Uh, I guess we'll find out tomorrow the results. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thanks to all presenters. Uh, we really enjoyed all the presentations. Thank you very much. I guess now it's um, there is a break. And then uh, the next session will start at uh, 16.45. Uh, anybody, uh, Dragon, would, like to, would you like to make, Dragon, Victoria, uh, would you like to make an announcement or we can close the session, I guess? Hello, hi, Yalitza, and thank you very much for this great session. Um, no announcements. We can come back uh, um, just in a few moments. So it's in 15 minutes or so, right? Uh, yes, in 15 minutes. And we will have an awesome keynote by Robin Christofferson. So uh, please uh, be here with us. Uh, and uh, that's it. See, every see everybody in the next session. <laughs>